Although I am praising the qualities of the Olympus Zuiko 12-100 Pro lens, landscape photography also requires a knowledge of weather patterns, an understanding of the location, and a keen eye for composition. Even if you own the best camera in the world, and incidentally, I am using the OMD EM1 Mark II, without these other skills, don't fool yourself into thinking that a fantastic computerized camera will guarantee the shot. I think we can leave that to instant gratification. The 12-100 Pro lens has a generous zoom ratio of 8.5 times from 12 millimeters to 100, that is 24 to 200 in film. Although the widest aperture is f4, it is constant throughout its entire range. It is a bit weighty, and ergonomically it handles best on the EM1, but it can be used on the EM5 or 10. On a long walk, I don't take any extra gear. I save to RAW and carry out post-production in Adobe Lightroom or Photoshop, so I don't need filters and neither a tripod, because Olympus image stabilization is the best you can expect. Less is more. Far more important is to save space in your rucksack for rations, extra clothing and maps. I've had the privilege to work with a mountain rescue team, but not as an active member, and have taken five outdoor first aid courses, so I know something about safety in the hills. I'll start at the beginning with a classic sunrise. They are difficult to predict, but what you cannot see is how I succeeded. It is taken from the hotel grounds. I had a bedroom facing the lake, so I could see the weather patterns developing. I even had time for a shave and a cup of tea. You can stay at HF Holiday's Hotel at Derwent Bank yourself, and members of my photographic party are already on the jetty. Because of its huge dynamic range, exposure is a problem. I set the EV to minus 0.3, as I often do, and spot meter a highlight to avoid blown out highlights that cannot be corrected in post-production. Some work in Lightroom is necessary, and I often shoot with that in mind. Here, is the unprocessed out-of-camera shot. I do not overcommit myself during photography, allowing maximum flexibility for later and a way out if things go wrong. Here is another shot taken a few years ago using the same technique. From the sublime, we move quickly to the mundane. I did wonder <laughs> why I took this picture, let alone include it here, but it does show a couple of interesting points. Consciously, I framed the path with that shadow, obviously by chance, and maybe the reason I took it in the first place, but it lacks a focal point, possibly someone walking their dog in the distance. However, what really grates is that bright cloud very close to burnout that cannot be corrected in post-production. A bit less exposure would have helped, but it would not redeem the picture. For the big view, and when you want clarity, you need the right day. This was taken late afternoon, the light so perfect that any camera even a smartphone could take a decent shot. Although there is too much foreground, its inclusion is important. It adds the third dimension to an otherwise two-dimensional composition. 
I am not adverse to atmospherics in landscapes, such as mist, but the overall prospect still needs to be clear. Although modest in stature, don't do Thorpe Cloud without correct footwear. As you can see, the rock is rather rocky, used here for depth and the third dimension. It is positioned to uh, one side so that it doesn't dominate the scene too much. Micro Four Thirds provides more depth of field than larger formats, but I have made sure that the whole image is sharp by using f11 and the wide-angle end of the lens. If clarity is not good, try something closer. Here, the single ray of sunlight piercing through the trees has made an uninteresting view a bit more striking. I spot metered the ray so that it retained some tone and not ending up as just a burnt-out highlight. Some cautious lightening of shadows was necessary in Lightroom. Toning down the sun would have been impossible, unless, of course, partially obscured by high cloud or mist, which we will see in the next shot. The problem when shooting directly into the sun is flare. Burning it out to a pure white bleeding beyond the sun itself. A zoom lens is not the best optic. Usually it is necessary to stop down to f16 or 22 to avoid flare, which incidentally is worse than diffraction. However, because of mist, I am able to use F11 to reduce, if not completely remove, annoying flare that would have ruined the image. This, of course, is a program about a zoom lens, but I have to say that a prime lens would have worked better. However, this shot succeeds to a large extent courtesy of weather by recognising and working with its qualities, and not just by relying on technique. With the sun's rays striking the sea, a burnt-out highlight stretching across the water would have looked plain ugly. By spot metering the sea, and with flare manageable, I used F8 to avoid diffraction, lightening dark areas in Lightroom. Later, the sun popped out from the cloud when flare caused by direct sunlight became an issue and, uh, I'm afraid, F16 a necessity. A favourite ploy is to pop the sun behind a tree and photograph the shadows stretching towards me. The perspective is exaggerated with the wide-angle end of the zoom, and again I spot metered highlights, allowing shadows to become underexposed, but this time to better effect, and I didn't have to lighten them too much, if at all. You may gather that I enjoy compositions having a high dynamic range. Rather than HDR, I prefer the greater control using the old-fashioned method, better known as traditional. Like the trees in their previous shot, it was my intention to render the memorial as a silhouette and swap meter the distant view. This is easy to accomplish with Olympus cameras. Provided the focusing and metering point is set to S-AF, you can half depress the shutter button to lock exposure and focusing before moving the camera to the required composition for the shot. Use manual focusing if different to metering point. Alternatively, and by using the electronic finder, take the EV down to a minus value until exposure of the distant view looks correct in the finder. 
One of my most memorable shoots, triumphs, if you like, was Scout Scar near Kendal, Cumbria, on the edge of the Lake District. In fact, I was leading a photographic party elsewhere in the Lake District, and because I had studied the weather forecast, I was confident that given the right location, we could get some stunning sunset shots at around 4 p.m. I had researched Scout Scar, and as it was on the way back, I was able to time our arrival precisely. The main view from Scout Scar is 180 degrees from Morecambe Bay to the Lake District's far eastern fells, and facing west, everything was in place for a great show of light, and we weren't disappointed. Obviously, my EM1 and 12 to 100 Pro lens was a great help, but these views would have never worked without the right weather. I have shown the metadata, but don't treat them as a magic answer. They are only an aid. You may be surprised that I sometimes shoot on program. This should not be confused with auto, and settings like white balance and metering can still be changed. Whilst program sorts out shutter speeds and apertures automatically, if you have program plus shift, that allows the photographer to make changes. The 85 times zoom is perfect for landscape photography. 12 millimeters is wide enough for drama without reducing mountains to molehills, and the 100 telephoto for detail. I tour with this lens, taking the 12 to 50 as backup. Now, confession time. One of the pictures was taken with this lens, and I'm not telling you which one it is. You can use your skills to see if you can find it. Otherwise, I don't need anything else. <laughs>